So your milk truck drives in, backs up to your milk house. The first thing he'll want to do is check the dipstick for the milk weight. And milk is sold in by the 100 weight. And on this stick, and every tank got one of these in it. This tank is calibrated. Um, and there's a chart that correlates with these centimeter numbers on here. So for instance, his, he would say, let's say it's 75.4. And then he would remember that or write it somewhere. And then he would turn the agitator on, which is this thing up here, which stirs the milk. So your milk is mixing. And he would go out while it's mixing. He would hook up his cord and his hose. Every milk house has a porthole. And this is our porthole. But he'd stick his hose through that hole and hook it up to the valve on the tank. And there's actually, so you got your where you can crack your valve, but he'd hook his hose here so he doesn't let the milk go yet. So anyway, he would um, take a milk sample. And I got one of these little sample bottles and and he's got like a stainless steel tool, a dipper that he can reach down in there and dip it and pour it in here. And at least gotta be up to that line. And then he's ready to pump the milk. So he would crack the valve Turn on the pump, so while the milk is pumping out into the truck, he would come here to record the day, the time, the temperature of the milk, which for this tank is on the back panel and digital. And some of them, the old ones, would just have a dial on the side, and either way. And then the number that he found on that dipstick, he would write here, and that correlates with this calibration chart. And every tank has one. So if you're at 23.3, um, you would be 1,232 pounds. And then that would be the number he'd write in here. And you can see here, these are initials, but there's several different milkmen that were here lately. They're kind of switching the routes around for some of these guys. But anyway, either his initials or his full name, and then his license number. And then the milk sample bottle, there's these stickers. And there's actually two of them. The round one he'd put right on top, so that would represent this farm. There's a number that represents this farm, or this tank, depending on how they're set up. But anyway, so that, and then there's another sticker on there that he'd have a book, like, I think they would call it like a manifest. So he would put that sticker in there, and then some of this information is on there too. So in order for to not mix this up. So this sample would represent how I get paid between what's in this sample and my weight number. So that truck will maybe pick up, oh, used to be maybe 20 farms to get a load, but maybe today, I don't know, maybe five, six, depending on how big the farms are. Anyway, so when he gets to the plant, the first thing they'll do is to take a sample of the whole truck. And they got this valve in the back there, and, they're, and, and then that sample gets checked for antibiotics which is extremely rare. It can happen, just human error. They do check it so they don't contaminate a whole silo because antibiotics will interfere with the cheese making process. And there's some people allergic to those things too. So we make darn sure that does not get into uh, the food chain. And once they get the clear, because that only takes a few minutes to check, um, the hauler is able to unload his truck into the silos uh, where they make cheese or whatever else they do with it. So then this sample gets sent to a private laboratory where they'll check it for a bunch of things and we're gonna go through some of that. So the quality card, you got your, and this will come every week, roughly. I mean, they got their days, but, um, so it'll have the date, the grade, which there's A and B, and it has something to do with some how you know, your system is set up, your well and stuff, but your tank number, some guys will have more than one tank, maybe on two different farms under the same name, so it'll be tank one, tank two. Um, your weight, and that, like we talked about with the stick in correlation to our, our chart here. And then our butter fat, and our protein, and usually our butter fat, you wanna see it over a four. I mean, they can vary a little bit. It's all mostly on what the cows are eating and their genetics a little bit. And if the butter fat price is really high, I mean, the the but you want your you know you want your butter fat to be higher, and like I said, that's a lot to do with how the cows are fed. Most of the milk check is based on the protein, and again, it's what they can use to make more cheese, or you know, it's it's got to be able to be produced into something. So the lower those numbers, the less they can get out of it, 
for the products they're trying to make out of it. And your other solids, um, that's kind of what's left over after that. And sometimes there's a pretty good market for that too. And somatic cell count, that's your quality. That's usually, um, that represents a somatic cell in a cow would represent if she has any infection in her udder. So let's say she has mastitis. This can be a real serious problem and she could get awfully sick. And if she has mastitis, sometimes it don't show up visually, but these numbers would just go right off the charts, especially in a small herd. One cow run into the millions and it'll set your average up. So we want to see this number under 400. Anything under 400, they'll pay us a few cents for, you know, they got their brackets on down. And this is considered to be extremely low. I mean, most of mine been in the double digits for a long time now and very rarely ever see them in the 30s, um, usually the 60s or 80s. But even in uh, 200, 150, very acceptable. I mean, it's natural. It's naturally to have that. But anyway, that's, that is uh, maybe more to do with the milking procedure, how healthy the udders are under your cows. And then you got the MUN, which is milk urea nitrogen. That's what that stands for. And it's utilizing the protein in the cow. And that's, that's a number maybe like your nutritionist would use to make sure that you're getting out of your protein what you're feeding them cows. You're getting some milk out of it and not just wasting it. Um, and so those, those numbers can vary a little. And then the freezing point, I think 540 is considered the cutoff where that has to do with how much water might have got added in the milk. Let's say at the end of milking, we got to push the milk out of the system, out of the plate cooler into the tank before we put the wash on. So then we're, we add a little water, sometimes maybe a quart or a pint of water will get into your milk, which is fine. But you start adding too much, what they call a freezing point number will change. And you don't want to do that because all you do is end up ruining your components. And that's how you get paid. So really, you're not going to gain anything by adding more water. It's just, um, it's just another gauge for the farmers to use to help keep things more right. So now after, you know, all those numbers are on there for the course of the week, you got your weekly average, you got your monthly average. Then you got like your European standards, and I'm not exactly sure how they how they figure that, but it has something to do with the trading. And this has been on for going on for quite a few years already, where we need to be, they wanted to have every plant under 400,000 somatic cell on average. And then it got to be they wanted every farm to be under 400,000 on average, which you should be able to do, and it had to do with quality of us being up to European standards, which I'm not even sure exactly why. Maybe it has something to do with trading. Um, these, you know, they got their rules and if we're going to sell our products to them, they want better standards than maybe we had, which ours are already pretty good, but you know, it's just a sales thing maybe more. We should look at um, what the card looked like when we were milking, when he was gone. Oh. <laughs> How it uh, how it came through? Did we uh, drop at all in so, quality or up in pounds or? Well, let's see here. So this one would be right in the middle of uh, when we were gone, and uh, everything stayed right in line. Somatic cell count used the big one, and that that and your bacteria is good. I mean, and those other numbers, it's just the type of feed we're feeding more. Now, really, butter fat and protein, you can end up buying your milk check. I mean, I've heard it said where, I mean, we can get these cows to really melt, but don't necessarily mean we're making money because you got to add a lot of proteins. It can be kind of touchy. Like right now, you know, we're probably getting a little over, well, maybe 55 pounds a cow per day, which isn't a lot. Anywhere between 50 and 60 pounds is that's pretty easy to get. Just some decent feeds, some decent genetics. But when you start getting wanting to get more milk than that out of them, it's, it takes a nutritionist, it takes a lot of testing. It, you really gotta balance that ration. And then you have to ask yourself, are we making any money here? Because proteins are extremely high right now. I mean, corn is through the roof, soybeans, and that's one thing that kind of slows down production. And they claim a thousand cow herds. I mean, these guys can add, uh, you know, a little bit more protein to their ration and end up, you know, flooding the market practically overnight because the cows will respond to it. The genetics is there for it. But when you don't push your cows, you let your cows kind of naturally give what they can give with the feeds you already have, which is 
usually you get healthier results or easier to get healthier results. And um, your cows last longer and all that type of stuff. Yeah, so to simplify that, um, farming's a business, even though it's a huge lifestyle too. Yeah. You gotta be profitable, but you gotta look at what you're getting out of what you're putting in and the longevity of your cattle and how you wanna go about it. There's some dairy producers that are pushing for those high numbers, but that might not be the most profitable or the smartest long term. It kind of depends on what you're into. Some guys are really into that, but you really gotta watch those numbers. You can go broke fast in this business. I mean, you can go broke overnight. You know, you get you make these decisions to say, hey, this is what I want, but you really gotta make sure it makes sense. And we find out, I mean, my philosophy's always been, it's, it's not how much money we make, it's how much money we don't have to make. I mean, sometimes it's just good to say you got some left and you don't have to necessarily uh, be worrying about all this financial stuff at the end of the day. So here's our wash center and it, you know, that's cooling and wash kind of all in one. And, and so I has, you know, once he's done with his, you know, chart stuff and the milk is pumping, he'll put, you put acid in here, he'll put soap in here and it all varies on the size tank. You know, everyone has to how much they can add. These units are usually, I mean, this tank is from the eighties and there there's probably newer simpler systems than this up out there already but but the, he's responsible to rinse this tank out when he when he's through pumping it hook up the the wash probe you know have a soap in here and then set the dial to automatic but they have to do that every time and if it's done right away so it'll do all this it'll do its rinsing it'll run the soap in and do its washing and then it'll do a rinse again and then it'll run the, what they call the acid rinse. You never want to mix your acid with your soap. You get some chemical reactions there where <laughs> we've been knowing to hear some horror stories on that. You can't breathe that stuff. So um, anyway, that'll sanitize and, and uh, keep everything safe and clean. Every tank will have a temperature gauge on it. And this one is set so the, the cooler will shut off at 38 degrees. You, the, the rule of thumb is, is, so if something went wrong with the cooler, they always say the milk's got to be cooled underneath, under 50 degrees or cooler. They like to see it down in 38 because anything above 50 will grow bacteria, I mean, rapidly under 50. But anyway, the trick is to cool the milk as quickly as possible. Comes out of a cow 101 degrees roughly. And then by the time it gets to the tank, it's maybe still 95 degrees. And uh, we run ours through a plate cooler, so you got well water, which is 50 degrees. So maybe then you can get it down almost to 60 degrees before it gets in the tank, and, right from the cows. And then the rest is this compressor, this unit, and that's basically a large unit of what you got uh, in your refrigerator. It's just a larger unit. And this thing will cool it down to well, ours is set at 38. You don't want it to freeze. Then your agitator will run on a timer, so that'll turn on, and I don't know if it's in 20 minute intervals or what it is. That's to make sure that the, the warm milk will always rise to the top so that it stirs the milk so it, it's got an accurate measurement of the temperature. I mean, the big thing with this whole process that we're trying to explain here is to keep this milk very clean and safe for the public to to drink or to, you know, to make cheese out of and all that. The last thing we need is something gets into the system by accident. And uh, so there's about, there's dozens of different safety nets that these, uh, anybody that handles this milk has to go through to make sure that this stuff gets to the consumer safely. All right, so that was a video about the milk house and kind of talking about the quality of our milk here on uh, our family's dairy farm and the process that the milkman goes through when he comes here to pick up our milk. So I hope you all enjoyed, but that's going to be it for the video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.